Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the organizers. It is the second time I participate in this great conference, but the first time was in person. Uh, it was even better, if I may say so. <laughs> However, <laughs> uh, given the circumstances, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to, uh, to be able to discuss this uh, uh, very interesting paper by, uh, by Shebnem. Uh, and um, I, I really enjoyed reading this paper, especially because it builds, uh, I think, extremely nicely on, on Shebnam's uh, 2019 Jackson Hall paper, which I uh, actually discussed uh, in Jackson Hall. So it's, it's great to see the, uh, the follow up that Shebnam has, has done, and she has done a lot of work uh, in her recent papers. She has really uh, done a lot of work and made a lot of progress, I think, in various dimensions uh, that she talked about uh, in this paper. Uh, build, building both on macro data, on uh, microeconomic data as well. So it's uh, she, it, it's really extremely informative uh, what she uh, what she has done in in her work, and it's uh, it, it's really very valuable, I think, uh, also for policy. Uh, so uh, in uh, the message of uh, in a way in the Jackson Hole paper, and here uh, the, the more refined message is that uh, U.S. monetary policy tightening leads to an increase in, uh, in emerging market spreads. We have this uh, international transmission of US monetary policy through changes in, uh, in risk perception. This is the risk spillovers that she talked to and analyzed a lot. The spillovers are higher for EMs than uh, advanced economies. They interact with country risk or policy uncertainty. Um, there is a limited pass through of monetary policy rate into interest, rate, interest rates in EMs due to fluctuation in risk premium. And uh, these fluctuations are affected by, by capital flows. She showed that uh, in her slide as well. And flexible exchange rates are uh, useful to smooth out these risk shocks. Uh, so that's um, a very important uh, message. Now, uh, so back in Jackson Hall, I'm, I'm sure Shemnem will remember uh, this graph. Uh, so as she was uh, showing that the US tightening leads to an increase in, uh, in rate differentials between, uh, between the US and emerging markets, uh, the natural question was, okay, so, you know, if we look at, um, at interest rate differentials uh, and UIP uh, uh, conditions between uh, the US and emerging markets, so yes, there is a difference uh, between the emerging market interest rate and the US uh, policy rates, which uh, uh, depends on the risk premia, which includes the currency risk premia and, uh, and, and other things. And when we tighten US monetary policy, we see a widening in these uh, interest rate differentials, but where does this widening come from? So uh, is it the case that uh, uh, we have, a, in a way, a strong financial cycle and uh, the emerging market is actually loosening? And despite the loosening in the emerging market policy rate, we can still see an increase in the risk premium. So that would be uh, that, that first case. So the emerging markets lose on monetary policy, but the risk premium goes up. And that accounts for the increase in, uh, in interest rate differential. Or is it the case that uh, the emerging market actually follows US uh, tightening? So increasing, it increases its rate. And then there is an increase in the risk premium, not necessarily very big, but really it's, uh, it's a kind of fear of floating uh, thing. And so the emerging market uh, tightens to stabilize the exchange rate. So that's, uh, that was a question. And so it's great to see that uh, indeed uh, Shemnem has, has dig, dug thoroughly into these questions and she has, <laughs> she, she has uh, done a lot of, of interesting work to sort that out. And, and here, I think, so she shows that uh, the medium energy market, or on average, the emerging markets, they decrease policy rate, and, uh, and they can do that, especially if they have a floating exchange rate, and this moves risk shocks. So I think it's a, it's a great uh, contribution already to, to point that out and to sort things out. Uh, and I'll come back to uh, this third question here, which is what is the mechanism between, behind these fluctuations in, in, in market sentiment, which was also a question which I think we can still uh, come back to here in this paper. So here is uh, the graph that Chairman has shown, the response of the UIP risk premier to US monetary policy shocks for emerging market uh, versus advanced economies. So you see the zero thing uh, essentially in advanced economies, you see an increase uh, for EMs. And in the case of Chile, so, so, uh, so I was quite puzzled, I have to admit, with that, <laughs> with that impulse response function. I, I couldn't really figure out what was going on here, because it, it's not a small, you know, it's a, it, it's a big uh, kind of negative effect here. 
And so I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand uh, what, uh, what is going on with Chile here. Uh, okay, so uh, if we, uh, if we uh, take a step back, and so we, again, we, we look at the effect of US monetary policy on, on risk premium in general, or on global uh, risk aversion. So as we know, uh, by many different measures, uh, US monetary policy tightening, so increases the value of the dollar, but also increases um, risk aversion, global risk aversion, and, uh, and uh, decreases the value of, uh, of risky asset prices uh, globally. Uh, now, what is kind of interesting, and, uh, and so this is a, uh, something that I would like to, to point out, is that just like what he shows for emerging market, but I think it's more, uh, maybe it was more expected in the case of advanced economies, when the US tightens, here you have the UK policy rate and the, the euro area policy rate. These two uh, advanced economies also try to counteract the effect of the financial tightening induced by the US monetary policy tightening by loosening their policy rate. So in a way, that's kind of similar. Uh, but even in the, in the case of, uh, of advanced economies, what we can still see is that, and, and, and so the, the UIP risk premium, I just show you, uh, showed you the, the graph of shed name in the case of the UIP uh, risk premium, there's nothing here. But if we look at um, corporate spreads uh, or, uh, or FTSE, so stock market uh, valuations, DAX or FTSE, DAX is the German stock market, FTSE is the British one, UK corporate spread or German corporate spread, so you see a tightening. So, Interestingly, even for advanced economy, despite the tightening, the loosening in the domestic monetary policy as a reaction to the US tightening, you still see transmission through the financial channel into corporate spreads and, and into um, stock market valuation. And if I remember well also, uh, Pierre Olivier had actually shown that uh, there was a, a loosening of, uh, of a Chilean uh, monetary policy uh, facing uh, a US tightening. So this is, a, this is an interesting, uh, I think, uh, fact about the transmission channel is that despite uh, the fact that both the UK and the Euro area are floating exchange rate regime, they also uh, you know, loosen their monetary policy. Despite that, we have transmission through financial conditions. And in a way, you find similar things for emerging markets, but in a way, we would have expected that even more for emerging markets, but it's still true in, a, in advanced economy. Uh, now, uh, there's another interesting paper which also looks at emerging market by De Gasperi, Hong, and, and Rico, who also uh, confirm uh, your results, uh, that uh, uh, there is both a loosening in emerging markets on average and, uh, and advanced economies when trying to offset uh, US monetary policy tightening. Uh, and uh, they also have some interesting uh, results about um, uh, channels of transmission, uh, showing, for example, that commodity prices are key for inflation dynamics transmission, while financial channels are key for real spillovers. I think that's, that's kind of also uh, quite interesting there. So here, this is their uh, paper. This is uh, the paper of the Gasperi et al. So you see that just like uh, for Shebnem, if we look at the transmission, the policy rate of a medium emerging economy, uh, it's, uh, it's a loosening indeed. Uh, we see some uh, reaction of the term premium here, the long-term interest rate. And we see that the financial conditions, just like in advanced economies, the financial conditions deteriorate, you know, following the, uh, and we see also evidence of, uh, of real transmission here. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. And, and here is also uh, in terms of spillovers uh, into the real side. So here this is for advanced economy. Uh, when they look at how uh, the US monetary policy shock transmits to industrial production, they look uh, at the baseline is the red line and then they shut down some uh, channels and for industrial production, clearly the important channel, when they shut it down, uh, the impulse response is quite different, is the financial variable channel. So the financial variable channel is important for real spillovers. For the CPI, actually, if you look at the, the important channel, is the commodity, pr commodity price channel. So this is, um, this is something that also could be interesting to, to look at a little bit more into uh, into details, maybe there are some, some variation across emerging markets on that. That's for another paper, huh? not for this. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and uh, what we also do, uh, and 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 here I don't know if you if you looked at it a little bit, Shibnam, but uh, in overwork I think you did, uh, is to uh, to try to uh, sort things out around the different exchange rate regimes. And here you see there is a bit of of heterogeneity. So this business about um, uh, the fear of floating, and uh, uh, the difference between the pure float and calling paid and managed float. It's not super precisely estimated, but we, we, we do see that there is a little bit of differences in transmission uh, and in terms of what the policy rate is doing uh, across this free exchange rate regime here. So here you can see the policy rate um, differs a bit in terms of reaction in the managed float case. Okay, uh, so this is why I was wondering, uh, when we look at your very interesting results where you, uh, okay, there's the VIX, which is correlated a lot with all these uh, deviation, there's also your interesting uh, results with the policy uncertainty index. And so I'm not, I was not completely sure what it represents exactly. And I don't know if there is any uh, correlation between that policy uncertainty index and maybe the type of exchange rate regime of a country. So I, I was wondering if you can tell a little bit more about that measure uh, because it does have seem to correlate in interesting ways uh, with the deviation in UAP. And indeed, uh, which characteristics of countries matter uh, for your, uh, you know, so we have Chile on one side, <laughs> we have emerging markets, we have advanced economies, but okay, uh, are there uh, some characteristics uh, a bit more identified that we, that we could uh, trace to the cross-sectional variation here? And finally, I go back to my question on what does the change, so I totally fully with you, the VIX is correlated with all these deviations, but then how do we understand these changes in risk sentiment uh, that you call a risk perception or whatever we want to call them. And so I think it does matter the way we think about that when we think about policy prescriptions. And indeed, are we, are we thinking about time variation in risk perception, risk sentiment, because they are due to different financial intermediaries who play differently. Some of them are really risk averse, others are really risk taking and their proportion, their importance varies over time. And this is what is, is driving these, these fluctuations in capital flows, in, in risk taking. Or are we thinking about um, you know, more behavioral explanations? Indeed, uh, we have some optimistic players. We have some uh, players who are overconfident, uh, a little bit a la Jenna Yoli and Schleifer. And is it what is behind these, uh, these fluctuations in, uh, in, in VIX in a way? So uh, this is a big debate, it's not for this paper, but I think in the end, we do have to understand because if it is, if it is more um, the mix of players, the mix of asset managers versus global banks, the lax, you know, the lax regulations of global banks at some point, maybe now the lax regulation on shadow banks, then there are things we can do <laughs> and we should do and, and we can target the policies. If it is a kind of psychological thing, you know, probably amplified by some constraints, then it's a little bit more tricky, but we, we could still identify the constraints that amplify the deviation from rationality, say. Uh, so so it, it would be great to, to make some progress on that. We know that in terms of the relative importance of players over time, uh, it changes in terms of international capital flows, and this reflects the relative market shares of different financial intermediaries. So for example, we know that before 2008, the very volatile fast growing flows were global banks. And this is the dark blue. We know that the market share of global banks has gone down and we have other players now, which are becoming more important. So these players are regulated differently, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is the type of questions that, uh, that we should be getting more into. And if we get into more this uh, into these questions a little bit deeper, I think we can then uh, have more precise targeted policy implication for macroprudential instruments, which want to use macroprudential supervisions, and uh, and and hopefully also um, have uh, things which are tailored to, to some uh, you know institutions of, for emerging markets vis-à-vis uh, -vis foreign currency debt, also as you point out, etc. So. It's a great paper once more, Shibnam, <laughs> and uh, you answered most of the questions and there's still this kind of, you know, what is it, this kind of uh, global fluctuations which correlate with a lot of things. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Helen. Um,
We don't have questions yet, uh, uh, but perhaps uh, Shabnam, since, since Helen uh, uh, issued a lot of questions and she's uh, 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 a little bit restricted by time, so perhaps I, I can give you the floor and, and so perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on, on these issues before we, we bring the, the, the additional question from the public. Yeah, no, this is this is great because you see what happens. So okay, Helen puts all these questions and I go and work on them, and now she has more questions. So I'm going to work on. No, this is this is great. I mean, no, I, I fully agree with everything. Um, uh, I mean, th there is a lot to do here. Clearly, I mean, we have to make sure we understand where is this risk sentiment things coming from because that will tell us exactly how much we can do with regulation, maybe how much we cannot do. So I, I fully agree with all that and. Let me, let me clarify a couple of things and then I will come back to this point. So the, the, but this is, okay, this is exactly why the heterogeneity is very important, right? I mean, so this kind of, the heterogeneity on the lender side, where is this risk sentiment coming from? I mean, is it really, you know, the, the, the hedge funds or banks should be thinking like that or there's something behavioral, but the same thing on, on the borrower side too. So that's why I kind of highlighted, we really want to understand the currency and the sector composition of the, of the, of the capital flows. It is true what Helen showed that like, you know, banks role is diminished and other players now are, are in the scene. But I think when you separate emerging market and advanced countries, you will still, still see a lot of bank, a lot of cross-border loans there. So, and this goes back to this point uh, of the spread that Helen showed. I mean, the corporate spread increasing UK and Germany, stock markets crashing. So that, that is all true. That, that happens in emerging markets too. So that happens everywhere, right? What I want to highlight is how, you know, in emerging markets, there is like even a much more basic step before even you go to the corporates, before you go to the long term, before you go to the stock market, just the basic law, right? So it doesn't even work there. So the, the point, this is why in the Jackson Hole paper and here, like I made a big point looking at these lending rates, short-term lending rates, like literally a rate on the loan, right? I mean, this can be your mortgage, this can be your 12-month working capital loan. So I really kind of want to, focus that and so show how that is way worse in emerging markets than advanced economies because advanced economies solve that problem. Of course, you know, when you look at longer term dated corporate bonds, co these corporates in, in advanced countries, they borrow directly. That's a direct issuance, right? I mean, so when you get into that stock markets, right? I mean, investors come there directly. So that are going to be all affected from this in spite of the loose monetary policy. I fully agree with, with Halan. That is also there in emerging markets. So, you think the emerging market gets a double bet, right? I mean, emerging markets are way worse because they are they can't even you know get this like really simple thing. I mean, this short rate disconnect I showed. This is these are rates less than twelve months. So your monetary policy, even if loosens, cannot affect directly your borrowing rate as a household, as a firm, less than twelve months. Why is important? Because this is real effect is going to be much worse for emerging markets, right? That's the thing. So. The advanced countries still may not smooth risk premium on the corporate bond, on the stock market. That's that, that I fully agree. But the fact that you cannot even do it at a, at a very basic, a short term loan is, I think, very telling. And the Descaparri paper is actually, is exactly the same. Look, advanced countries, the same story is there, but it works more on the longer term stuff, on the term premium, on the, on the things that are directly linked to global financial market. Here, this is all domestic. I mean, you can be a household in Chile or you know, a, a small SME, small medium enterprise in Chile and Turkey. You have nothing to do with the external people, but you are still, you are still affected. So that, that's, I think, the, 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 the kind of risk sensitivity and the emerging market different comes from. It is worse for life is worse for them and trade off is, is worse for them. Uh, but I fully agree uh, with Helen that we should definitely do more to get at this, um, you know, what, what else we can do. If we go with the flexible exchange rate, somehow that volatility needs to be managed. So there, I think the results are saying it is now less and less fear floating and more and more domestic financial conditions. Although I definitely we need to do more work on that. And that's because uh, something Helen showed, right? If we start separating those regimes, floating, manage, manage, float, crawling, it is very important how you do that manage. Okay, so that's what it comes down. If you look at these uh, detailed appendix of uh, Iletsky, Reinhard, Rogov, if you do it with some sort of counter-cyclical macroprudential or counter-cyclical capital flow management, you know, that might be okay. If you do it with the policy rate, you use monetary policy to manage the exchange rate. So that's the, the wrong thing here, basically, based on my research, because that is going to mess up your policy credibility, it's going to increase policy uncertainty, and then you are going to go to a world, forget about stock markets and corporate bonds, I mean, you cannot even have a handle on your short-term borrowing of your households and small firms. So that's kind of 
I think the, the message I want to focus on, but I, I, I fully agree with everything Helen said. And uh, the last point is this risk center. I don't think it is you know, kind of that behavioral. I don't think there is a A type of investor that says, oh, I'm going to only do these risk investment or a B type of, I'm going to be super discovered. It is, it is, there is some, probably some of, I mean, you know, Janelle and Schleifer work, our behavioral work is very, very impressive. And there's some of that, but I think that is somehow, even there's some of that is combined with these effects of risk on risk of shocks, global financial cycle and US monetary policy. And that is combined with what the borrower country do. I mean, you earn credibility and you, so if you just say my inflation target is 5% and then the next day you are not just going to get credibility, right? I mean, you have to earn it. And this is actually the argument, the debate you are having in US right now, right? I mean, if, if you, you know, have a decade there, you cannot hit your target. I'm sorry, but that you don't have credible policy. So I think that is something like that's That's how that risk sentiments move around, right? I mean, there is something inherent that you earn as the emerging market that takes time. And there's also these, you know, uh, the kind of behavioral thing or the thing that, you know, somehow becomes off and on during these big, big shock events. So I'm trying to get at like both. And what I'm saying is there's, there are things emerging markets can do too. I and mean, yes, we need to regulate these institutional investors and the global things, all that. I fully agree, but there's, there's, there's homework to do also on the emerging markets part. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have one question from, from the audience here. Um, Let's see if they should. I, I don't know if they are supposed to, to, to put them live. <laughs> I, 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 can, you, can you hear me? I think, I, I yes. think you're talking. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Let, me, let me just go ahead. Although I don't know what's, my screen looks a little weird, but. You can hear me. I actually have three quick related comments. I, I, think, I think maybe we've talked about these before, but it would be nice to control for expected inflation because, I mean, even though emerging markets have had lower inflation the last two decades than previously, uh, you know, especially in the in the first part of the century, it was still, you know, higher than uh, advanced economies and more uncertain. So, you know, you could probably find the survey data on that, and that would be helpful. Uh, the, the second thing is, again, this whole issue about what causes this increase in risk sentiment. And I, and I quite agree with this whole discussion, except, you know, one thing to be precise about is that, you know, balance sheet constraints themselves, even without greater uh, uncertainty about policy, could lead to a kind of more risk aversion. You're more constrained and you act like you're risk averse. But, but by the way, I mean, you know, if it's more uncertainty about inflation, then that, that's all the more reason to you know, uh, control for the expected level of inflation because those two probably go together. And the third, uh, you know, it's not a comment about your paper. I just want to throw this in. It's the same comment I made about Atlantis. And if anyone like you shouldn't want to work with me on this, it's fine. I'm not going to do it by myself. But I do think that it's kind of overemphasized the role of policy shocks because I think what is uh, possibly even more interesting is to ask how different aspects of the U.S. monetary policy rule uh, lead to spillovers uh, in, in risk and other things in uh, emerging markets. So it wouldn't be that hard to figure out what the, you know, implicitly the rule is and then uh, ask, well, what if it was, you know, if this was altered or that was altered and how does that uh, affect the risk premium, uh, you know, especially during these global downturns. Thank you very much. Shavnam, I think this is going to be the only question because we are running out of time now. <laughs> oh, so you great. have, let's say, one or two minutes to answer. <laughs> yeah. So no, I mean, I fully agree with Charles. So we did control for inflation, but of, of expected inflation. That, that's that's a very nice point. So we should not just the actual inflation, but um, it, it would be important to control for expected. I fully agree. So um um and yes, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the models we are going to write down can be on, on several dimensions, right? I mean, you can capture things with balance sheet constraints, financial friction, arbitrage. I mean, you can capture the, the same aggregate thing in the data with different ways of modeling it. I mean, that's a little bit what I was trying to get at when I showed the UIP and CIP. A lot of these things will be captured with the CIP too. I mean, if there's any, uh, some sort of uh, arbitrage friction because the balance sheet is constrained. So, I mean, there's something more in UIP, but, but I fully agree. And this is something that we should do more in the data to get at where is, where is this coming from. Uh, and on the last point, Charles, so yes, I mean, here I, I work with Shark. 
and I, I, you know, I, I, I cannot speak of Helen. I mean, Helen, Helen works with both, I believe. But what I want to tell you is one recent development in the U.S. U.S. literature because of the ZLB. I mean, because these these surprise shots are going to be extremely small during the ZLB period. So people, um, you know, basically take a moving average representation of these to get at the monetary policy stance. Um, this become um, now very widely used um, in this literature. Uh, so it is, I mean, if you have this long period of ZLB, even you use surprises, you know, you, you are going to get at the stamps. But, you know, in a much longer sample, like going back to 90s, uh, that is definitely something we need to, we need to think hard. Yeah, I, I agree with you.